Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Granada Forum on June 17th, a Friday night. We are very pleased to welcome Mr. Richard McDonald, a man who's a maverick in his field for over 30 years in the law. He's a law researcher, educator, and state citizenship. So let's give him a warm round of applause for Mr. Richard McDonald. Get my mic here. Butterfingers. For, for those people who don't know me, my name is Richard McDonald and I live up in Box Canyon. And I'm a legal researcher and educator. Uh, I started doing this in 81. So I've been around for a little while. And all I do is teach you the law. You make your own decision. You abide by your own decisions. I only show you what the law is. The law is very important because everybody has to obey the law. I obey the law strictly. How many people here went to high school? Raise your hand. How many people studied history? <laughs> Let's give you a history lesson, 101. George Washington was not a US citizen. He's a citizen of Virginia. Benjamin Franklin was not a U.S. citizen. He was a citizen of Pennsylvania. That's who we the people were that founded this nation. They were state citizens. They were not U.S. citizens. U.S. citizens did not exist in 1787. So if they did not exist in 1787, they do not have any portion of sovereignty. Not, they're not part of we the people. They can maintain no portions of sovereignty. They do not have allodial rights to property or to land. Legal distinction being made. Why is that important? A U.S. citizen, according to the courts and the law, are merely citizens of the federal government and legal entities. In being legal entities, they have the same status as Taco Bell, General Motors, or any other corporation. They can be regulated, controlled, and taxed because they are legal entities. A lot of people complain about being U.S. citizens, but they don't want to do anything about it. They want to keep the, their benefits coming. It's important that you understand who you are and what you are. In law, I'm not a person. What I am in law is a citizen, and that's excluded in all laws. Persons. Let's give you a little definition of the word person before we go into some of our, our thing here. Let's take the vehicle code, California vehicle code. Person means a natural person, a corporation, trust, uh, limited liability company, or any other legal entity. So that person's a legal entity. If you are a legal entity, then you do not have access to the to the Bill of Rights, because of course the rule, the 14th Amendment did not incorporate any of the Bill of Rights. So what did they have? They gave them Title 42 in lieu of access to it. It's very important that you understand. Well, I'm gonna be going through uh, uh, some court cases here to give you an idea of what the courts say. Don't believe me. Believe what the courts say. The courts will always tell you the truth, but you have to know and understand what the courts say. And please hold all your questions till the end of the, then we'll uh, write your question down. At the end, we'll take your questions so we don't get interrupted here, okay? Write this down. Jones versus Temmer, T-E-M-M-E-R, 829 Feds up. 1226. Repeating, 829 Fed Sup 1226. This is a 1993 court case. And listen what the court said. Quote The Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment protects very few rights because it neither incorporates any of the Bill of Rights nor protects all rights of individual citizens. Instead, 
This provision protects only those rights peculiar to being a citizen of the federal government. It does not protect those rights which relate to state citizenship. So you call, in 1993, federal court, district court's calling you a citizen of the federal government. So what is the federal government? Let's find out what the federal government is. Is the federal government a nation, state, or country? No. What is it? The United States government is a foreign corporation. So you're a citizen of a, friend of a foreign corporation, i.e. a legal entity, a franchisee. And you've heard of the Franchise Tax Board? That's all they're doing is taxing your franchise here as a U.S. citizen. They always tell you the truth, but you must know what the truth is. It's very important that you know what the truth is. So you can base your decisions on what the law reads. Since the federal government is not a nation state or corporation, and you're merely a, a resident, resident means alien, let's go to California Government Code Section 242. Persons in the state, not its citizens, are either citizens of other states or aliens. So if you're a citizen of the federal government, what are you? You're alien according to California law. Resident means alien. I'll prove that to you, real simple. When America sends an ambassador to France, there he becomes a resident of France. He's alien to France. When the federal government allows one of its franchisees to come to California, they're a resident of the state. Alien. I'm not a resident. Resident has 758 different meanings. I may be a resident of the city, I may be a resident of the county, but I'm not a resident of the state. Define what you mean. The most important thing I can tell you is anytime you're dealing with any governmental agency, always ask them to define what they mean. I do not understand. Please define what you mean. Define what you mean. That's multiple meanings. The United States has three separate meanings. <laughs> Which one are you talking about? It's important. This is a 1979 court case out of San Diego Federal Court. U.S. versus Otherson. That's O-T-H-E-R-S-O-N. 480 Fed Sup, 1379. 1373, I mean 1370 at 1373. Quote, listen what the court said. Very interesting. Upon introducing the provisions which eventually became USC Section 242, its sponsor, Senator Stewart, explicitly stated that the bill protected all persons. He noted that the bill simply extends to foreigners not citizens, the protection of our laws. So if federal law can't protect me, I'm not subject to it. The laws of Tokyo, Japan can't protect me because I'm not subject to them. If you're subject to the law, it can protect you. I do not have any civil rights whatsoever. I have God-given rights. U.S. citizens do not have God-given rights. They have statutorily granted privileges, <laughs> which can be regulated and controlled in tax. And we're going to get into that. Next court case, Wadley versus Newhall. W-A-D-L-E-I-G-H versus Newhall, 136 Fed, 941. Repeating, 136 Fed, 941. Quote, rights under Title 42, United States Code, Section 1983, are for citizens of the United States and not of the state. So I have no civil rights. I'm not protected by any civil rights. I have state rights. Okay. Why is it important to be one of the people? It's very simple. We the people founded this nation. We the people have a sovereignty. 
Here's a court case. In the same year I was born, 1829. <laughs> That's the same, the same number as my license plate, by the way. Lansing versus Smith. 21 dicentennial. There's four Wendell 9. I'll give you four Wendell 9. W-E-N-D-A-L-L 9. Out of New York State. Listen to what the court said. Quote, People of a state, with a small s, are entitled to all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his own prerogative. Whenever they talk about sovereignty, they talk about people. They never say persons are sovereign. People. So I'm one of the people. How many people are human beings here? Raise your hand. <laughs> human beings a monster. Second class citizen. So I'm not a monster. The only way you can describe me is four different ways. You're either a man or a woman, a citizen, one of we the people, or a human. If you describe yourself any other way, you are now stepping into the, the, their laws. None of their laws refer to those four. Yes? Repeat it again. Uh, citizen. Human. Man or woman. Or one of we the people. Those are all come right out of the Bible. And the government doesn't use the Bible. It's a man or woman and citizen from the Bible. And the Bible talks about humans. It don't talk about human beings. How many people here know what the legal definition of a human being is? If you go into a Valentine's 1948 Law Dictionary, it states specifically a human being is a monster. Then if you go over to monster, it says a monster hath no inheritable blood, albeit be brought forth in marriage. But if they had human shape, it may be air. And a quote from Valentine's. Where did it come from? How many people here have heard, 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 excuse me, heard of the Holy Crusade? During the time of the Holy Crusade, the knights and princes and kings were going across Europe on their Holy Crusade. And along the way, they stopped and fathered a few children. Well, to keep the children from inheriting the land and the sovereignty and, and taking the thrones when they grew up, they call them human beings, being like a human. So when you say you're a human being, you're telling the world, I'm not capable of being a sovereign and maintaining any portions of sovereignty. Remember we talked earlier about civil rights. Let's find out what civil right is. Write this court case down. Nickel versus Rosenfield. That's N-I-C-K-E-L-L -L -L versus Rosenfield. 82 Calap 369. Repeating, 82 Calap 369. A civil right is a right given and protected by law, and a person's enjoyment thereof is regulated entirely by the law that creates it. I have God-given rights. I've gone into court, and I've had several of my people go into court, Say, Your Honor, I have God-given rights. Can you regulate my God-given rights? And they won't even go there. You have to know how to stop them. I don't have any civil rights. I have God-given rights. Are you saying I don't have any God-given rights, that I'm an alien and a slave? I'm a second-class citizen? They ain't going to go there. Write this down. I have a website. It's www dot state, S-T-A-T-E, dash citizen dot O-R-G. I got a lot of information up there. You can download your heart's content. In addition, I do an internet radio show four nights a week. And the link is right there on the website. And you can listen to me rant and rave on the internet four nights a week. I tell people the truth. And I read court cases, and I explain how to utilize them. 
The web address again is www.state-citizen.org. www.republicradio.com. But the link is right there on the website also. I was audited by your friends in 1981. And they treated me like dirt. I was a detective sergeant for a local PD. I walked in there. I had three guns on me, four pairs of handcuffs, and 100 rounds of ammunition. I was working fugitive detail that month. <laughs> I, was out, I, was, I was out chasing murderers. You know what I mean? Murder suspects. And so I walked in there, and they treated me like dirt. I mean, I've never been treated so bad in my life. And here, I'm a law enforcement officer, and here, I never treat people as bad as I got was treated. So I started to decide to find out how they could treat me so bad. So I quit the police department, went to work for Lockheed, and took the graveyard shift so I could work at night and go to law library in the daytime. I'm going to find out the truth of the matter, you know what I mean? And I researched from 1981 through 1985. And I Xeroxed every court case that pertained to revenue. I was trying to figure out why they could treat me, and I couldn't find out anything. In 1985, I found this court case. Write this one down. K. Tashiro versus Jordan. K. Period Tashiro. T-A-S-H-I-R-O versus Jordan. 250, 256 Pacific 545. Repeating, 256 Pacific 545 which is a California Supreme Court case. And this is what the California Supreme Court case said in 1927. Citizenship of the United States does not entitle citizen to privileges and immunities of citizen of a state, with a small s, since privileges and immunities of one are not the same as the other. So I am, I'm a good U.S. citizen, you know what I mean? What's that state citizen sitting in that chair over there got that's different from me? So I started researching State citizenship, citizen, you know what I mean? Because I'm a researcher and I'm going to go back and find out exactly where it came from. And then a couple weeks later, I found this court case. Write this one down Crossy versus Board. C R O S S E versus Board. 221, Atlantic 2nd, 431. Repeating, 221, Atlantic 2nd, 431. It's a 1966 court case. Quote, both before and after the 14th Amendment to the federal constitution, it had not been necessary for a person to be a citizen of the United States in order to be a citizen of his state, with a small s. So if it hadn't been necessary, why was I? So I started researching, doing all the contractual nexus that put me in there. I found out driver's license, vehicle registration, bank accounts, so, uh, social security. But the most insidious one I found out was a marriage license. Read what happens when you get a marriage license. Write this one down. Roberts versus Roberts. 81 Calap 2nd, 871. Repeating, 81 Calap 2nd, 871. Quote, the state is a party to every marriage contract of its own residence, as well as a guardian of their morals. It didn't say citizens, the residents, the aliens. They always tell you the truth. They can guard your morals. So that's why they can do whatever they want with you. Residents, they can't touch a citizen. How many people know how many constitutions there are in California? Yes? No, there's one. There's we the people of California created the 1879 constitution. The legislature created the 1879 constitution as a legislative grant to the people. And they repealed it in 1974. If you read it, it's, the Constitution was repealed in 1974. <laughs> it says right in the Constitution. But why are they publishing it? Hey, you U.S. citizen, I got this Golden Gate Bridge here. You want to buy it? 
There's two constitutions in California, one for state citizens, one for U.S. citizens. You mean 1849? 1849 is still valid. There's two constitutions. We, the people of California, created 1879. I mean 1849. 1879 was created by the legislature as a legislative constitution granting uh, U.S. citizens access to certain portions. That's why the legislature can modify it anytime they want. They always do everything legally correct. But you must un know and understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. There's always an ultimate reason for everything the government does. Why is that important? Because the government will never violate the law. They may ignore you, but they will never violate it. You, they, you have to know how to box them in so they cannot uh, roll over you. And you do that by asking questions. I don't understand. I don't understand what you're saying. You, say, you, you claim I'm a, a resident of the state. Well, Your Honor, according to my research on the term resident, it has 758 uh, different meanings and resident basically means alien as it relates to the state. Are you saying I'm an alien and a second class citizen in this state? Is that what you're telling me, Your Honor? I don't understand. Please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> don't be afraid to ask a question. It's the most important thing in the world to be able to ask a question but know the answer first. Don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. Remember we talked earlier, how many people remember the old mom and pop grocery stores sitting around where they never had business licenses and the old gas pump outside where you pump the gas up to the thing there and come down to your car? <laughs> I remember that. Sitting there, pump the lever, you know, gas, pump the le up to the gas and you went, got five gallons. And it flowed down, downhill into your car. They never had licenses. They didn't get business license until 1960s when they got their social security number. And if you go to Ventura County and get a copy of Ventura County's business license, it says right on the bottom in very fine print. You got to get a magnifying glass to read it. It says all business licenses are voluntary. Yes, yeah, right on there. Because you're a U.S. citizen. We're going to talk about that right now. Next, what I'm going to read to you is from Ruling Case Law. It's a set of law books, uh, Section 131. 26 Ruling Case Law, Section 131. You can get this at the law library. Quote, a state may impose an excise upon the franchise of corporation engaging in a business which every private citizen has a right to engage in freely. So you already established your franchise, so the state can impose it. Okay? A right common to every citizen, such as the right to own property or to engage in a business of a character, not requiring regulation, cannot, however, be taxed as a special franchise by first prohibiting its exercise and then permitting its enjoyment upon the payment of a certain sum of money. So you have to have a constitutional issue. You have the right to work. It comes on Article 1, Section 1 of the California Constitution. How many people have been to, I'm trying to think of names, right over the Colorado River there? They've got one on both sides of the river. I'm trying to think of it. What's one of those right by the river there? What? Speak up. No, it's a it's a city. A city. It's on both sides. Huh? No, it could be Lake Havasu, but I'm not sure what it is. But I got it documented at home. It just come up to my head. I can't remember. But
but they have a city ordinance, like, just like all city ordinances. Every business must be registered and pay a license fee. That's subsection A. Subsection B, except those that, uh, under, under the Constitution. So if you claim you're operating under the Constitution, then you don't, you're outside the business license law. They convicted thousands of people on this law, under Section A, but nobody ever goes to Section B and says, I'm doing it as a right under the Constitution. You always have to use the Constitution because the Constitution secures your rights. It doesn't grant you anything. Your rights predated the Constitution. But you have to know. How many people here are registered to vote? <laughs> you know, when you register to vote, you put an automatic lien on all your property. It's right in the election code. California election code, section 5300. It's right there, right in the law. Law never changes. They always tell you the truth with those people. Pardon? California Elections Code, Section 5300 was where the lien is. And 700 is, it says the voter's registration is permanent. 701 says if you want to cancel it, just send them a letter. Then if you want to go to the back of the book down at 5300, you know what I mean? I always put it in the back of the book because nobody's going to, there's no pictures back there, so they're not going to look. <laughs> if they're not going to look, oh, would you do me a favor and give me those two constitutions you had here? I'm going to read out of the Constitution rather than read out of my Xerox copy so people will believe me better. California Constitution, Article 3, Article 3, Section 2. Listen to this. The boundaries of the state are those stated in the Constitution of 1849 as modified pursuant to statute. Sacramento is the capital of California. So where are the boundaries? The Constitution doesn't create anything. The Constitution creates a country, a nation, and it has boundaries uh, along the river, this way, that way, longitude, latitude, using meets and bound directions. You know what I mean? 1879 does, has none. Let's go up here to the front of it. California Constitution of 1879. Okay. Which is only for U.S. citizens. It's a legislative grant. Now look at the Constitution for we the people of California. Big difference. Then he goes to boundaries. Let's see where the boundaries are. Okay. Don't know where the boundaries are, but they're listed in here. Now listen. What we the people restricted from page 68. This is a different version than what I got. <laughs> the boundary of the state of California shall be as follows. 
commencing at the point of intersection of the 42nd degree of north latitude, etc. That's the way a nation is founded. So why in the 1879 Constitution do they refer to 1849? Why didn't they just repeal this and reenact it over here? Can anybody answer that question? Why? Let me ask you a question. As a citizen of Japan, can a Japanese citizen go to Mexico, vote, and change their constitution? Can the citizens of the federal government come to California, vote, and change we the people constitution? So what do they do? They create a second constitution. Just that simple. Legislative enacted. <laughs> they never lie to you. They always tell you the truth, but you have to know. How many people heard uh, people talk about the judge saying, I don't want to hear that Constitution crap in my court? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen why the judge can say that. This is uh, N. Ray Johnson's estate, 73 Pacific 424. Repeating, 73 Pacific 424, quote, an alien has no right to raise it whether, the question of whether a statute is violated of the Constitution. This is, I don't want to hear that Constitution crap in my court. Because you're an alien. He looks at you as through his eyes as an alien. How do you get around it very easily. When in state court, use the state constitution. When in federal court, use the federal constitution. So when you're in state court, use the state constitution. And refer to 1849. And they're going to say, well, you can't use 1849. Well, the 1849 constitution was written as a restriction and limitation upon the government. The 1879 is the legislative grant of powers, privileges to the people, which you're going to utilize. Very simple. Do you want to demand your rights or do you want to get it as a privilege? Okay. After I start bringing this section forward, in the 1990s, I think it was 93, they, they pulled it out of the penal code. This is the for, former penal code section 228. Any citizen of this state who shall fight a duel cannot vote or hold public office. I'm paraphrasing it. 232. Any person who fights a duel cannot vote or hold public office. Why do they have two sections? in the 1972 Penal Code, one for citizen and one for person. Because they're two different animals. A citizen is not a person. Penal Code says so. They removed this and combined it under assault with a deadly weapon. What happened in the 1960s? Two guys got in a duel faced off and they got caught. They were dueling. Well, and then they tried to charge him under 228 of the penal code. Well, they had a smart attorney and says, hey, they're persons, they're not citizens. They're U.S. citizens, they're persons, they're not citizens, so they can't be charged there. So the legislature in their wise endeavor made a section just for U.S. citizens, saying the same thing as one for state citizens. Just that simple. Of course, when I started broadcasting it, because I read the code, you know, and I read the laws, and I started talking about it, they repeal it and put it under 245 assault with a deadly weapon for everybody. And this says any person, but I'm not a person, so it doesn't apply to me anyway. How many people know what the definition of a lodial is? Elodial, 
free, not holding of any lord or superior, own without obligation or vassalage or fiality, the opposite of feudal. Like my tie is allodial. Allodium is land. Land held absolutely in one's right and not of any lord or superior. Land not subject to feudal duties or burdens. That's the lodeo. Okay. I have numerous court cases at home saying all the land in the 13 colonies was given to the people in lodium. Okay. Now here's California's admission into the Union in 1850. This is what the legislature, uh, Congress said, quote, be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that the state of California shall be one and is hereby declared to be one of the United States of America and admitted to the Union on equal footing with the original states in all respects whatsoever. So all the land in California is given to the people in Lodium. In fact, there, I can try, stand up here with a straight face and say they're not taxing one square inch of land in any state in the Union today. They're not taxing land. Valentine's 1948 Dictionary. Allodial. Free, not holding. In England, all lands are held by the crown, and none are allodial. In the United States, all lands have been allodial since the American Revolution. So if they're not taxing land, what are they taxing? Citizens. Subdivision lot, assessor parcel lot number, tax lot number, etc. A fiction can always tax a fiction. That's the principle of law. California in 1895 started the first subdivision plot map. They redesigned all, make subdivisions, and they did in 1895. In 1905, 10 years later, they decided to tax those subdivision plots. They're not taxing anything with meets and bounds. They're taxing the assessor parcel lot number, tax lot number, subdivision lot number. I ran across this one by mistake. Most of the good stuff I find out, I find out by mistake. I was doing some research on some other subject, and I found this California court case out of Sacramento about Malibu. A guy in Malibu had lot A. Lot A here was right at the edge here, looking over look the, the ocean. He just let it sit there. He bought it back in the 40s. He just let it sit there. In the 60s, some guy come along and uh, being a contractor, he bought this lot C over here, facing the other way. So he went and approached the contractor who handled all of, who created the lots. He says, "I want you to change lot A to the over here and change lot C to over here." So he did it. They switched the description down to County Recorder, and. Built a beautiful million dollar home there overlooking the ocean. So a couple of years later, this guy's driving down, he's tell, showing his family his land that he owns right here. He's going to build a house someday. There's my, uh, what's that house doing on my land? <laughs> <laughs> so he sued him. And when it got up to the Supreme Court of California, the Supreme Court says, when you buy land, you have to buy it by meets and bounds. If you buy it by subdivision lot, it's a fiction. It can be moved and transferred any place you want. I can take lot B and put it over here, lot C, put it over there, move it any place I want. Because it's a fiction, it can always be moved. Anyway, he won his case, you know what I mean? But the fact that the court ruled in his behalf, but it says when you buy land, you have to buy it by meets and bounds. I have a friend of mine up in... Uh, I'm not going to say what county he is, because I don't want to get him in trouble. He's got a nice lot, about an acre and a half, house lot. So he went out and had it, his lot surveyed. 
with meets and bounds. Then he had him says, take one foot off the corner and, and, and leave that. Don't survey this one foot, one square foot on this corner here. And he went down the county recorder and says, I'm redescribing my lot. This is uh, my lot, assessor parcel lot number, is subdivision lot is over here. This one foot by one foot. And all the rest is held in a lodium. <laughs> by meets and bounds, it can't be taxed. He's been fighting with the county for three years and they've been trying to re stretch it back out and they can't do it. <laughs> but he knows what he's doing. You can have all, all kinds of fun. If you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. <laughs> what more can I say? How many people can tell me how many states are there are in the Union? How many states are there in the Union? Anybody else? Thirteen. No. Anybody else? 101, according to federal law. <laughs> In Title 31, Code of Federal Regulations, 31 CFR, Chapter 1, Part 51. That's uh, the fictional state within a state where the federal government operates. There's 51. 31 CFR, Chapter 1, Part 51. Okay. That's the fictional state within the state, as the United States Supreme Court calls it. Let's read the definition of governor. Governor means a governor of any of the 50 state governments or the mayor of District of Columbia. That's 51. Okay. Now if you go over to governor, governor means a governor of any of the 50 states with a small s. So that's 101. Right after I started broadcasting this, I did a, the Buck Act video, which I think Dennis still has some of them available. And I sent uh, to some attorney friends of mine in Washington, D.C. They were showing judges. Right after that, your favorite uh, president, Bill Clinton, re uh, by executive order, ordered these two sections be omitted from publication. Not repealed, just omitted from publication because people couldn't see the definitions <laughs> by executive order. If you go up there and look at it for up now, you're going to find out that's not there. It's omitted per executive order. But if you go back to the older one, uh, 1991, it's right there. Huh? 31 CFR, Chapter 1, Part 51. It's omitted from publication. Because you don't want people. When the attorneys in Washington, D.C. start asking judges about this, what does this mean? Eh, your friend Bill Clinton, uh, I'm the only one that's ever got an executive order written against what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's take a break for a couple minutes here and so I can get a coffee warm up and we'll be right back and we'll talk some more. Give about five minutes or ten minutes. Thank you. There's coffee and dessert over there. Those people are interested. I don't eat dessert. I'm too sweet now. Okay, we're back from the break now. Everybody uh, grab your seats and... Uh, Get some masking tape on there. The first thing I'm going to talk about is your court system. If your people want to talk, please go outside. We're going to talk about courts and why they do what they do. Because one reason. Every court is a Nisi Prius court. That's N-I-S-I. P-R-I-U-S. It's the Nisi Prius Court. And you can box in a judge in any type of case you're involved in. 
A U.S. citizen state citizen makes no difference. This is a general judicial notice that affects everybody. Okay. This is demand for judicial notice of rule Nisi within a Nisi Prius court. I'll read this and I'll explain how it operates. Notice is hereby given on blank day of blank 1996 at 1330 hours or soon thereafter as the matter can be heard in courtroom blank of the above entitled court. We'll move the court to take judicial notice of the following. Paragraph. This court is part of the Nisi Prius court system codified in 1935. The Nisi Prius courts are, quote, are such as held for the trial of issues of fact before a jury and one presiding judge. That comes from Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition, page 1197. This court, by being part of the Nisi Prius court system, must follow Rule Nisi, which is a, quote, a rule which will become imperative and final unless cause be shown against it. This rule commands the party to, to show cause why he should not be compelled to do the act required or why the object of the rule should not be enforced. And that comes from Black's Law Dictionary, page 1497. Paragraph. Since this court can require compelled performance, which is only allowed in a court which is enforcing some type of contract, it is Hornbook law that all contracts are either in equity or admiralty for enforcement purposes. Contract law forbids unjust enrichment to either party. Thus, based upon the foregoing, this court must take judicial notice that this court is merely enforcing some type of contract that would allow Rule Nisi to apply. Therefore, the court should dismiss this matter if the prosecution does not produce the contract or prove with admissible evidence that the accused was involved in the activity being regulated, with admissible evidence that invokes the authority of the court. Hearsay or presumptions will not be permitted since this is a criminal trial where an accused justly demands due process secured to him by the state constitution. We filed this notice in the, on a traffic, no driver's license case in Santa Barbara. And the judge says, yep, I'm accepting this. He says all the courts in the nation are Nisi Prius courts. They're all contract courts. When you get a traffic summons, that's a Nisi Prius summons. It's in order to show cause. So you have to take the rocks out of your wheelbarrow, put it in the government's wheelbarrow. You make them prove you're involved in the activity, being regulated. And the judge up in Superior Court there in Santa Barbara told the prosecutor, Mr. Prosecutor, you know what you have to prove. If you don't prove it, I'm dismissing this case. So what does the, they have to prove in a traffic case? First, you're a person, a legal entity. Second, you're involved in commercial activity. Two, you're an alien. Three, you're uh, not entitled to any rights or privileges. Four, that you're a second-class citizen. Five, that you don't have the right to own property. Six, you can, I can go on and on. I can give you about 20 different things they got to prove. Just on a traffic citation. Just from this one pleading. If you know how to operate with it. Same way any type of court case you're in. All federal courts are Nisi Prius courts also. Make them prove every single element. What's the first thing they got to prove in federal court? That you're an alien. You're a resident. You're a legal entity. That's uh, s several years back, a friend of mine was uh, ordered to show cause in downtown Atlanta. And I mean, downtown LA. I don't know why I'm thinking of Atlanta. Uh, he was in downtown LA. And so uh, he walked in there and he said, Your Honor, he said, I don't know why I'm here. The prosecutor, Mr. U.S. Attorney over there, is making allegations that I'm a legal entity. I'm not a legal entity. I am who I say I am. I'm a man. I'm not a legal entity. I'm not incorporated. I'm not a legal entity. And the judge looked over to the prosecutor and said, Mr. Prosecutor, is that true what you're said? You're making allegations that he's uh, 
a legal entity. But, Your Honor, he's a tax protester. That's beside the point. He's not a legal entity. Can you prove he's a legal entity? If not, go home. <laughs> it was in order to show cause. See, which is an easy Prius argument. And you have to prove, take the rocks out of your wheel, make them prove every single element of the alleged offense, regardless of what it is. There's numerous court cases saying the government has to prove every single element of the alleged offense, both state and federal. But you must know what those elements are. And if you listen to my internet radio show, I talk a lot about them. I give you different arguments that can be valid in, in traffic cases, could be in a code enforcement cases. A lot of people have code enforcement problems, you know what I mean? Building and safety problems and et cetera. They have all these different problems. But you must know what the arguments are. And you can't do half an argument. You must do the whole argument. And remember, when you're dealing in law, there's no room for emotion. All emotion belongs in the bedroom or the bathroom, not in the courtroom. <laughs> the bedroom or the bathroom, not in the courtroom. Because if you can get the judge to be emotional, he loses. We've had district attorneys cry and get sent out of the courtroom. We had judges take off the robe, throw it on the floor in front of the podium, march out of the courtroom because he got so emotional. Because you're boxing them in. Learn how to box the judge in and make him obey the law. That's all you have to do. Make the judge obey the law. Because if he obeys the law, he can't convict you. There's no conviction if he obeys the law. It's very simple. Same with the police officer. One of the great scenarios I teach people, and I do it quite often on a radio program, at least once a month I'll, I'll do, go through this little scenario. You go through, you get a traffic citation for whatever. Okay. Officer, do you know and understand the law you're enforcing? Yes, I do. Uh, are you employed by the people of the state? Yes, I am. Are you a state peace officer? Yes, I am. Then you turn around and look at the judge and say, Your Honor, since the officer has testified under oath that he is biased against me as being the employee of the person that's prosecuting me, I'd like to invoke the hostile witness provisions at this time. When you invoke the hostile witness provisions, you can ask leading questions that you, he can't answer. To give you a scenario, you ask a type of question that no matter which way he answers, he loses. Question. Do you still bite, beat your wife on Tuesday nights? <laughs> if he says no, that means he's still a wife beater, beats you some other night. <laughs> if he says yes, he's a wife beater. <laughs> no matter which way he answers, he loses. The only proper answer, I never beat my wife. But you, you don't give him that opportunity to see. Answer the question, yes or no. <laughs> That's, what That's what they do to you. So you do it right back to them. So you learn to ask questions like that. On all traffic citation, I teach people to ask three questions. You can do it in any type of case, building safety case or any other type of case. Same three questions, just paraphrase them a little bit different. Officer, you attended the academy. Yes, I did. Did you study the vehicle code? Yes, I did. How long did you study vehicle code? 40 hours. Good. And how long have you been on the department? 20 years. Uh, 20 years and you average uh, two traffic tickets a day over a period of 250 days a year. That's 500 tra uh, traffic uh, citations a year. And 20 years, that's 10,000 traffic citations you've written in your career. Is that about approximately? That's about right. So after 10,000 traffic citations, you're pretty well expert in the matter, aren't you? Yes, I am. Oh, you can get cocky now. You're building his ego up so you can slap him on the head. And then uh, you say, Officer, do you have personal knowledge? That's a key phrase. Do you have personal knowledge? 
of the legal definition of the word vehicle as utilized by the legislature when they wrote the vehicle code and as defined by the courts. Do you have personal knowledge of those definitions? He's going to look at the judge and look at the prosecutor. The prosecutor's going to jump up and say, objection. You say, Your Honor, I'm not really trying to ascertain the officer's personal knowledge of the law he's trying to enforce. The judge is going to say, well, answer the question. Do you have personal knowledge? He's going to say, no. Don't worry about it. Go to the next one. It's a three-phase. You march him off the edge of the cliff so he can fall on his sword. Question number two. Officer, do you have personal knowledge? You have to phrase with all questions. But do you have personal knowledge of the legal definition of the word driver as used by the legislature and when it was changed from chauffeur to driver by the legislature? Do you have personal knowledge of that? Uh... Objection. A prosecutor's going to jump up and say, Objection. Your Honor, I'm merely trying to ascertain the officer's knowledge of the laws he's enforcing. He, if he doesn't understand the laws, he can't enforce them. Just so I answer the question. Do you have personal knowledge? He's going to say no. Then you go to number three. Officer, do you have personal knowledge of the legal definition of the word traffic as used by the legislature when they wrote the vehicle code? He's going to say no. Okay, then you look at the judge, you look at the prosecutor, look at the judge again, and look back at the prosecutor. You're pausing, waiting for an objection, okay, when there's none coming. Your Honor, based upon the officer's testimony, under oath, on the witness stand, I'd like the, the witness to be excused for lack of personal knowledge of the laws he's enforcing, so as an incompetent witness. We've had a CHP officer 24 years on the department bin. Rule is an incompetent witness. Now he's working the desk. He can't work tight si traffic citations because <laughs> he's been ruled an incompetent witness. So he, he, please excuse the officer, and the officer walks out the courtroom. Then you look at the judge. He ain't finished with him yet. Your Honor, do you have the traffic citation in there, in the jacket? Yes, I do. Your Honor, I, I move to strike that because it was written by an incompetent individual, so therefore, please remove that as incompetent evidence. So the judge takes that out. What, do you, what else do you have in there? He says, oh, I got the docket sheet. Well, Your Honor, since there's no complaint and all you got is a docket sheet, I move to dismiss all charges. And that's the way it went. <laughs> but you have to work over there to get there. You follow me? You have to follow their procedures, you know what I mean? Get rid of their witnesses. Get rid of the traffic citation, then there's no complaint. It wasn't a complaint because it was written by an incompetent individual. <laughs> huh? Huh? It's still, it's incompetent. That's true, but I mean, you, we don't go there. You know what I mean? We, we, I want to win the case. I want to go to those side arguments. Well, I could do the side arguments just for three years. The judge has to dismiss it. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to win those side arguments. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's go over here another one. <laughs> This is demand for judicial notice. This you can have a lot of fun with this one if you know how to utilize it. Why do you use judicial notices? You file judicial notices before you enter a plea because it sets the law of the case, law of the court. The judge is supposed to walk in the courtroom with a completely blank mind. The prosecutor brings in his law, the defendant brings in his law, and they both put them in before the court and the judge is supposed to be totally neutral. Yeah. That's the way it's supposed to be. But you can make them do it that way. But you got to do your arguments before you enter the plea. Because once the plea is entered, the, the law is already set. So you have to do it. You dropped your glasses, ma'am. This is demand for judicial notice of the legal term human being under the evidence code, section 450. I'll skip the heading. 
will move the court to take judicial notice that the term human being has a definite legal meaning. According to Ballantyne's Law Dictionary, professor of law, University of California, 1948 edition has the following definition. Human being, page 599, see monster. Monster, a human being by birth, but in some parts resembling a lower animal. A monster has no inheritable blood and cannot be heir to any land, albeit brought forth in marriage. But although it hath deformity in any part of its body, yet if it hath human shape, it may be heir. And it comes from the 12th century. This is in concurrence with the principles in the Bible where the terms used are man, woman, and citizen to describe people according to their status. Therefore, demand is made that the accused be recognized as a man having the status of a citizen and not a human being. This information is necessary imperative to the issue before the court and one of the primary defense issues. So the judge says, well, I'm not going to accept it. Oh, Your Honor, are you claiming that I'm a monster? <laughs> no, judge. No, I'm not going to accept that. It's judicial notice. Well, if you don't accept the judicial notice, you are in, in the same breath claiming that I'm a monster and I'm not a monster. He says, well, I'm going to deny this. Then you turn around and look at the court reporter, the clerk, and let the record reflect for appeal purposes. The judge is denying my judicial notice and making allegations that I'm an, a monster, I'm a second-class citizen, an alien within the state. I didn't say that. Well, Your Honor, by denying my judicial notice, that's basically what you're saying. And I need this for appeal purposes since I'm being convicted. Nothing. He's got to let it stand. Either that or accept your judicial notice. How many people have had traffic warrants on them? You know, all traffic warrants expire after 60 days. That's right. All warrants expire after 60 days. They can't arrest you if they pull you over after 60 days. It gets dismissed. I have a friend of mine who gets, uh, he's a very atrocious driver, okay? He gets stopped two or three times a year for doing crazy things. One time cutting off a CHP officer, another time driving off uh, with no headlights at midnight, you know what I mean, and stuff like that. <laughs> but he gets traffic tickets, or doing 90 in a 60 mile an hour zone or something. Yeah. And he always lets them go to warrant. Because after 60 days, the warrant gets dismissed and all underlying charges are dismissed also. Yeah, it's a warrant one, W-A-R-R one dot zip on the internet. It's a free one, okay? I'll read it and you can get it, get it off the internet. Notice of motion and motion to dismiss for lack of prosecution and lack of due diligence. Please take notice that on blank day of 1991 at the hours of 0900 hours AM or as soon thereafter as the matter can be heard in Department Division 1 of the above entitled court, accused citizen blank will move the court to dismiss all charges for lack of prosecution, a violation of the due process, and the failure to perform due diligence. Comes out accused who moves the court to dismiss all charges for lack of prosecution and violation of due process by the lack of due diligence in serving the warrant. They didn't sign. Points of authority is only one page. Very short paragraph. The accused has been available for service of process at all times. Since the date of the alleged warrant, the accused has been living at the same address in Canoga Park California since blank. He has been a property owner in the area since blank. The accused is well known in the community and a local property owner. The people have no, made no attempt to serve this warrant upon the accused, nor can the people make a showing that any effort was made to serve the warrant and bring the accused within the jurisdiction of the court for trial. Such inaction is an unreasonable delay as the accused has been available service of process. This warrant was issued on blank and this constitutes a violation of the speedy trial rules. It would be most unreasonable to hold the delay of 
four months, five months, and serving their warrant constitutes due process. The California Appellate Court stated, thus it appears that the constitutional requirement of a speedy trial requires that a defendant be served with a warrant of arrest within a reasonable time after filing of a complaint. And that court case is Rost versus Municipal, R-O-S-T versus Municipal, 184 Cal App, 2nd, 507. Repeating, 184 Cal App, 2nd, 507. The Ross case involved a delay of approximately 140 days. This court has also held that a 60-day time limit was imposed upon the serving of a warrant, wherefore an accused moves the court to dismiss the charges, respectively submitted. Very simple, little three-page document, and you get rid of your warrant and the charges. So you don't have to go to court, you can file here. You can file it by mail, but if they arrest you, you it's there, just by knowing the law. So, okay. So I'll take questions for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes here, then we'll call it evenings. Anybody got any questions? If anybody's got a question. There comes a gentleman. Some, pe not, some people have, you know, go before a commissioner and say, I want to see a judge, and they say, you're not entitled to see a judge. Well, uh, you sign, uh, the, you can do a motion to, uh, that you want a judge, and a, a traffic commissioner is only there with your approval. What if you challenge jurisdiction and they say denied when they have to prove it? No, you... you Jurisdiction is a three-legged three stool. You know what a three-legged stool is? Three legs. Every court has jurisdiction to determine jurisdiction. In personam jurisdictions, whether you're the person defined in subject matter, whether you're defined in the law and is brought by the prosecutor. So which one? If you say, I challenge jurisdiction of the court, he's going to go say, yes, I do. I do have jurisdiction. You cannot say that. Yeah, I challenge subject matter jurisdiction or in personam jurisdiction. I challenged in personam jurisdiction, and he said denied. Did you do it by paperwork? Yes. I'd like to see the paperwork. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I've never had a judge deny. Well, he was a commissioner. That's why he wasn't a judge. Well, Your Honor, uh, well, then, then what you do then? Uh, in that case, I'd like a continuance right now. I'm going to take this up on a writ to the appellate court since you're a commissioner, and I want a full judge to hear, make, review this matter because he, he cannot rule on the law. Commissioners cannot rule on the law. You can back him off like by saying that. Your Honor, since you're a commissioner, can you rule on the law and make a determination of law? <laughs> He's going to say no. Well, Your Honor, then you can't rule on my motion. <laughs> you can't deny it. Yeah, and I never entered a plea. He entered a plea for me. Well, but you, you did it wrong. Your Honor, you cannot enter a plea for me. The provisions in law say that I must stand mute or refuse to enter a plea. I'm not refusing to enter a plea, and I'm not standing mute. I'm challenging the in personam jurisdiction until such time as we determine the law. You know what I mean? He can't enter a plea. If he does, it gets re re kicked out when he gets upstairs. Motion to withdraw the plea. Erroneously entered by the court commissioner. Since he did not have my power of attorney. Or if he didn't want to enter my plea. So, uh, you, you, when next time you come back in the court, you'll say, where's my proctor? What do you mean, your proctor? Well, Your Honor, the commissioner entered a plea for me, and he's my, acting as my proctor, as my attorney. Would you bring, bring Commissioner Jones over in here, act as my, my uh, attorney, <laughs> my defense attorney? <laughs> Make them obey the law. Good. <laughs> There's, read the law. Quit reading the funny books. <laughs> what are the funny books? 
Anything that's not a law book. The one with the pictures. Okay. <laughs> the one with the pictures. <laughs> no, but you see what I'm saying? You read what the law says. Read the court cases. The courts make a decision on what has to be done. And you must follow those guidelines. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, ask you a question. How would you handle it, uh, let's say, a friend of mine where they, they had drug him into court and then they forced him to have a public defender and he didn't want one. How would you handle that situation? Oh, well, I, I love that. Okay. I had a friend of mine, he was forced into a public defender and he brought all his pleadings and everything and he says, can you find, get, find, uh, find me not guilty using these, uh, this argument? And the public defender says, I can't do this. He says, thank you. you know, would you please notify the court that you're unable to defend me, to find me not guilty, and ask for outside counsel? And he finally got a $300 an hour attorney over there to come in and defend him. <laughs> the court paid for it. <laughs> thank you. That's, that's quite yes. Can any of these uh, uh, documents that you've got be used... Uh uh, like after you've already gone to trial and no, like when you're already like when you're in the appeal process. No, most of them are pre-trial, during trial. Okay. Yeah, because you have to set all the uh, issues at the trial level. You can't raise anything new unless it's a constitutional argument at the appellate level. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm pretty good. I answer most of the questions as we go. If not, we're going to call it an evening. It's five minutes to ten now. Oh, the Patriot Act. Yeah. Okay. I have to stop and think. A lot of people are concerned about the Patriot Act. I'm not. There's uh, two little rooms down the hall there, a ladies' room and a men's room, and they have little rolls of uh, a Patriot Act there. You know what I mean? <laughs> the Patriot Act's been to court three times. They've challenged portions of the Patriot Act three times. And every time the Patriot Act's gone to court, it's been overruled and ruled unconstitutional. So um, I don't worry. Next time somebody's going to take the Patriot Act, it'll be ruled unconstitutional. Section by section is getting ruled unconstitutional. So it's, it's no problem. Can you tell me what that man on the other side of Mars is doing right now? I can't either, so I don't worry about it. He's trying to look around Earth. <laughs> I don't worry about it. Yes? Uh, one other question. Uh, what do you think about uh, going after the officers and the judges' uh, oath of office? It's a good argument, but you've got to do a lot more before doing that. You follow me? That's a procedure where you're going to go for facts. I teach people to make the facts come out in your case, because the courts only rule on facts. And if they've got no facts, they can't. It's just like... Uh, in order to sustain a conviction, in 90% of cases, be it a traffic infraction, code enforcement case, uh, felony, or any misdemeanor case, they have to get the DMV record in to establish that you're a resident of the state. Without the DMV record, they can't get a conviction. There's no evidence to establish that you're here. And I perfected a, a technique where we keep the DMV from getting that record in, and uh, there can, uh, can be no conviction. Because I learned this from the city attorney's manual of Los Angeles, which I happen to have a copy. It says it is, it is important to get the DMV record in, in all traffic cases. Failure to do so will be fatal on appeal. Yes? Richard. Um, <clears throat> I got, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a letter from the Franchise Tax Board stating that um, claiming exemption because of state citizenship was uh, frivolous and that religious objections 
Yeah, uh, that's the standard a letter. Aliens, yeah, all of that meant nothing. That I still, with the, if I was earning money in California, I owed them money. Well, tell you write them back a letter, and you would state, uh, uh, "I have the same political status as our founding fathers did." Are you denying that I'm this and that I'm an alien in California and a second-class citizen and a legal entity? Okay. If you're making these allegations, please put it in paper. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ask questions. Okay. And the other one, um, passports and the, um, the, I, the national ID. Uh, I don't, I, I have an old passport, but I don't have one as a state citizen. Yeah, and, well, don't um, even worry about it. I'm uh, not going to be able to, if, uh, it's going to cause me trouble if I want to get on an airplane to go see my brand new grandchild that's being born in a month. Well, I'll just use the old passport. Just use the old, the one that's expired? Yeah. Tell me you, you haven't renewed it yet, because, but it's still valid. Okay. It shows you who you are. You Do, doesn't it have my social security? Old... Don't worry about it. Oh, okay. You've got you, my patriot number 11. You've read that? There's two citizens of the United States. Which one are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the manual. Yes, sir. There's a million <laughs> things in your manual. <laughs> read patriot number 11. Okay. It explains all the arguments. All right. Thank you. It's on the internet for those people who don't have my program. At the beginning of the meeting, though, Richard, you, you were telling Diane that you, you don't worry about the national ID issue. They keep bringing it up, and it's come up again. So could yeah, you I don't worry about it because uh, it's part of the Patriot Act. So you have to learn how to utilize the law. Read the Patriot Act. Don't talk about something you haven't read. In order to invoke the Patriot Act, they have to prove that you're a member of a terrorist organization. Okay. Two questions for you. Two questions for you. One, are you available for consulting if we have like legal or technical stuff that we need to try to figure out a strategy for? If it's not, like, I you know, teach you the laws, what I do. I'm okay. an educator. And okay, so I, I can email you a question if I have something. That yeah, and I can give okay. you, okay. tell you which court case to read. Okay, good enough. And uh, also, um, with the new real ID cards coming in, is there a way to avoid having to get those as far as... Uh, There's going to be a way. Okay. They haven't come yet. Huh? There's a couple court cases in the court system already now. You've heard okay. of Gilmore case. Okay. Now, now realizing that they, they have a need to be able to identify who they're dealing with when they pull you over, what would be the best way to handle that? Just give them whatever you got. Okay. I mean, if you don't want to use their state California driver's license. I, I use federal ID sometimes. Uh-huh. Oh, like a, a letter addressed to me. Ah, there you go. Gotcha. <laughs> Perfect. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> a letter addressed to you at your home address is delivered to you by the federal government. It's federal ID because it's a felony to receive somebody else's mail. <laughs> okay, with that, we got one more? Okay, Wendy. Okay, thank you. Don't drink my coffee. That was a wonderful evening by Richard McDonald. Let's give him one more round of applause. Oh, I forget about this thing all the time. I, know, I do too. Almost killed myself earlier. Um, we'd like to thank uh, Richard McDonald one more time for another one more round of applause and thank him so much for coming in tonight. Thank you for attending the Granada Forum and the next one will be uh, July 7th, 2005. Thank you so much and God bless.